Some years ago, I made my first initial presentation as a fellow of the DSPC, a consideration of how Catholicism informed my professional career. The first response from the audience was, that's brilliant, but aren't you extinct? <laughs> Sadly, circumstances today make that reaction even more likely. I'm now an octogenarian at a time when technology and political correctness dominate the world, especially academe. Moreover, the meaning of disinterested has been largely lost as a way of thinking and behaving for all that the computer's thesaurus offers, fair-minded, unbiased, impartial, without prejudice, neutral, objective, able to see all sides. When I listen to the stories of those who are currently professors of literature and language, they tell of antagonism, required exceptions for students so that they need not encounter anything that makes them uncomfortable, an expected bestowing of A grades, since, after all, students employ professors and deserve value for money. The university has often become a place for sharp business transactions. I am acutely aware that I would not survive in this world, and thus deeply saddened. However, I rejoice because God has bestowed on me singularly bless singular blessing. I am retired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thus left to pray, study, and write, a form analogous to Dominican preaching. Today affords an opportunity to emerge from my scriptorium to speak directly about English studies. I'm most grateful to be a fellow at this convocation. Since much of my research has been devoted to chivalric romance, I live in a world of high idealism and faith, characterized by unending quest and determination to persevere in spite of obstacles. The post-chivalric knight errant Don Quixote, my current book subject, tilted at windmills that he perceived to be giants. Alas, today's opponents of English studies, indeed of the humanities and arts, are unfortunately very real giants. Those who study and profess these disciplines have always been challenged to defend their choice, including the unfortunate, if you can't do anything else, you can always teach. <laughs> Nevertheless, I strive to be a champion, however quixotic. When I joined the faculty of the College of the Holy Names, now Holy Names University, English was the preferred major, a sign that it was the efficacious way a Catholic woman could prepare for a worthy life as person, wife, and mother, and perhaps also a professional career. This, after all, was 1958. Moreover, English studies had a place outside academe, the Catholic Voice, the diocesan newspaper, printed reviews of current novels of interest to Catholics. Today, psychology has replaced English, as it has philosophy, as the preferred major by those who ch do not choose practical training. Sought objectives are critical thinking, leadership, and cultural competence. No longer mentioned are written and oral skills in expressing oneself in English. Are these essential competencies obsolete in the age of Twitter and texting? Fellows were asked to address the state of knowledge in one's discipline and its significance to the faith and or its relation to the evangelization of the culture. While I am not casting myself and the discipline that I love as victim, I can only describe English studies as in a parlous state as are foreign languages and other literatures. Vast changes since the 1960s inevitably determined how the discipline is valued, its decline. Professors replaced the core canon within a sense of history and a moral tradition with highly specialized topics, typically not with a literary focus. Moreover, they created, embraced, impenetrable academic jargon that even their peers could not follow. 
I can't tell you how frequently my husband and I peruse literary journals and read aloud obscure passages for satiric effects. <laughs> Our version of the editor of a journal who wanted to have a large stamp which said, so what? <laughs> Today's approaches are especially ironic since, in fact, English studies were established initially to foster higher education more broadly than did Greek and Latin, favored for centuries but restricted to an elite from which many, especially women, were excluded. David Lodge, in his satiric novels of Academe, describes what happened. Robin, the heroine of nice work, was swept into the glittering wave of theory. Structuralism and post-structuralism, semiotics and deconstruction, new mutations and graftings of psychoanalysis and Marxism, linguistics and literary criticism, the latest thought of Roland Barthes and Julia Kristeva. Robin forced her mind through the labyrinthine sentences of Jacques Lacan and Jacques Derrida until her eyes were bloodshot and her head ached. She sat in lecture theaters and nodded agreement as young Turks of the faculty demolished the idea of the author, the idea of the self, the idea of establishing a single univocal meaning for a literary text. The consequences are obvious when Robin lectures about 19th century novels. What Robin likes to do is deconstruct the text to probe the gaps and the absences in them, to uncover what they are not saying, to expose their ideological bad faith, to cut a cross section through the twisted strands of their semiotic codes and literary conventions. What the students want her to do is to give them some basic facts that will enable them to read the novels as simple, straightforward reflections of reality and to write simple, straightforward, exam-passing essays about them. In my day, as a student and as a professor, such cleavage between the interest of scholarship and pedagogy were not typical. I am an old, old historicist. Courses were major authors, Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Milton, or chronological, Renaissance, early modern in today's parlance, 18th, 19th, 20th century. The happy marriage of literature and history that provides context outside one's own limited moment is, I think, essential, as is a core canon that provides a basis for conversation. Too much of today's analysis, literary or political, begins with a Procrustean bed, a rigid ideological frame into which all must fit conform, everything else is denied. Typical courses are feminism, masculinity, materialism, clothes, money, garbage, cultural <laughs> bias, and queer studies. Texts are read to support issues rather than to try to encounter literary masterpieces and to understand something of the medieval or the Victorian mind and thus broaden knowledge and qualify one's limited awareness. With apologies to patriotism, and especially to fellows who are Americanist, I urge that Catholics need English studies because the major texts were written before the Protestant Reformation, while history and literature began in the United States with 17th century Puritanism not very hospitable to Catholicism. Medieval literature is Catholic, Indeed, distinctions between religious and secular do not apply. Medieval drama tells the stories of scripture. The Canterbury Tales are heartily of this world, told by men and women from every estate, but on a religious journey, the pilgrimage of life. Troilus and Cressida, a romance set in pagan Troy, ends with the slain lover hero looks down from the eighth sphere upon this little spot of earth, and laughs. Chaucer urges his hearers, readers to, and I'm gonna translate here, look up to the God that made them after his image and to think this world passes soon as a fair flower and love him 
that for love upon a cross to buy our souls first died and rose and sits in heaven above, for he will betray no one that places his heart entirely on him. Shakespeare was long claimed as Protestant, yet this transcendent writer's affinities to Catholicism are now recognized. Even ardent Anglicans admit his Catholic habit of mind. Milton, of course, is aggressively Protestant, but Catholics gain from encountering his passionate Christianity and biblical knowledge as well as classical. As conclusion, I offer a broad argument, which for literature means telling stories. First, I cite my favorite Oxford anecdote. The principal of the college interviewing a potential student asked, why do you want to study? The applicant answered with gushing enthusiasm, I want to realize myself. To which the principal sagely replied, surely my dear, we can do better than that. <laughs> Or as St. Thomas More prayed, Lord, do not permit me to trouble myself with that very cumbersome thing called I. And recall Chesterton's orthodoxy. Complete self-confidence is not merely a sin. Complete self-confidence is a weakness. Believing utterly in oneself is a hysterical and superstitious belief. I know no better way to avoid this failing than to encounter great literature of the past. I join Chesterton in advocating that marginalized group, the dead. <laughs> Finally, I refer to nice work, the aptly named novel. Robin makes the basic defense of English studies when the CEO of a manufacturing plant challenges her job. Wilcox regards English as a soft option perhaps okay for women or mancy boys, but ask why others aren't studying something practical, engineering, computers. Robin replies, because they're more interested in ideas, in feelings, than in the way machines work. He counters, won't pay the rent though, feelings, ideas. When she asks, is money the only criterion? He persists, however, he looked startled, caught off balance for the first time after she asked, what about happiness? And simply declares, I don't earn much money, but I'm happy in my job, or I would be if I were sure of keeping it. <laughs>